producer and writer of My Life in China and the director here, Kenneth Ang. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Um, 24th Annual Florida Film Festival. That's really exciting. Very exciting. How did you Very guys react when you found out? I mean, that's over 1,600 films that were submitted, and you were one of those 1,600 films. Wow. Did I mean, you know I, that? I didn't know that. <laughs> it's, that, that that's amazing. I, it's, I'm kind of speechless, but I mean, We've been working on this for so long, six years, and to, to get a phone call from Matthew Curtis, the programmer at the Florida Film Festival, I was on a freelance shoot. I, I literally stepped aside and I was silently screaming. <laughs> and I, I told him, I made a promise to Matthew Curtis that I would kiss him when I saw him in person. And it was, it's a wonderful feeling to work on something you believe in for so long and finally have a chance to share it with the world and that you, because you know people, it'll, maybe perhaps resonate with that, people can relate, and hopefully people get out something out of it, and it's just an honor to be here. Oh. And how was your, what was your feeling, what was your reaction? I was when? great, it's always great to, you know, work on something that you know is good, and then have, you know, another group of, of people validate that, and really just bring it out here, and, you know, one of the big things about being, you know, a writer is, you know, you spend so much time writing and writing and writing, <laughs> and that never sees the light of day, so to work on a film like this, and to, you know, just, I mean, we had a couple hundred people there. There's going to be a couple hundred more people with next showing. So it's just great. Yeah. And just to see that, you know, the, the greatest thing for this process has been to see how, uh, you know, how relevant Ken's story is to so many people um, in the community. And so just the shared um, story that people have, it just, it's just great for, to be and a part of And it resonates with me, definitely, being a first generation as well, um, Asian American. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and where you grew up? Yeah, uh, I grew up in Boston. Uh, it's it's a pretty old school city, I and mean, a lot of Asians, a lot of different uh, minority groups. They're all trying to coexist, and being going to a public school, it, you know, it's tough. You know, you're trying to get along with everybody, and you you're trying to be like everyone else. But then, you know, I realized that I sort of lost some of my own distinctness, my own Chinese, and my identity, and. My whole life, I was kind of embarrassed about who I was, and I, I mean, I grew up in the projects of Boston, and mm -hmm. I was so ashamed because my mom had, a, you know, she uh, went through menopause and had dementia, paranoid schizophrenia, while I was still in high school. So, so how did you get into film then? I guess is that was that a passion of yours throughout high school, or I would say so. I mean, it was something that I, I wanted to do. I wanted to. I wasn't the most popular kid in high school, so I wanted to f be something different or s have something that I could, you know, uh, identify myself with. So I, it was early on that I took art AP, music AP classes. I took photography classes during high school, Art Institute of Boston. I interned at the Wang Center in Boston, which is like this, the main theater that has Phantom of the Opera and oh, wow. uh, Smith Saigon, and I would help, help do tours and educational workshops there. Just really interested in the arts early on. And, you wanting to do the arts, like how did they feel when you started making films and like, you know, this isn't your first film. No, I mean, what, they, your, what were your projects before? Like you've done a couple different projects, right? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, the, the kind of kid that would never listen to his parents and would <laughs> rebel against. I think everything. there's a lot of kids like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and like maybe it was because of the stereotype of being Asian American. Maybe yeah. I was rebelling against that. You got to be really smart and this and that, and that, maybe that was what I was. So you're too. maybe trying to uh, not conform to your Asian American identity, like just like you're trying to find your own path. Um, and if your parents, like I got to lecture all the time, you know, this is what you should have done. You should have sure. gone to law school. You yeah. should have done this. And I'm like, I'm I love the arts. I'm passionate about it. Um, and so, I mean, how did your family feel when you started making the movies and? wanting to make a career out of this too. I mean, I don't think they really understood what I did for a long time. And I, it took three films to, for them to really understand. I mean, I, I did a film in India in 2001, right, sort of right after getting out of college. And then I made a film in Japan about high school baseball. Um, they didn't really know what was going on, even though it was a PBS broadcast. You know. Wow. Um, Tell us a little bit more about that project. OK, yeah, I mean. <laughs> It's, I'm just interested in knowing personally. So. Yeah, I mean, I d I've been trying to figure out my vision for my body of work for the longest time, but it I've somehow led to cross-cultural films. Um, uh -huh. First film I sh we shot in India was about the biggest cultural gathering in, in uh, Indian society called the Kumbh Mela, this big bathing festival. Really? Where they're purified all their sins. It's the mother of all Hindu festivals. And 
that's when I realized that you can use these big events or something to learn about other cultures. Yeah, cultures. So we were over there and we had tried to figure out what we want to do next. Like, oh my God, it's so great to make a film, to be out there, to meet people, to make friends, make a real connection, see what we can really learn. Because yeah, you know, all you but get that's really far. News. That's that's yeah. in Asia, but removed from Chinese culture. Yeah. So how did you get started with that project? You just wanted to learn more, or? Yeah, I mean, I was working with uh, my friend Casey, who who's really into the arts. Casey Fitzpatrick. His mother is a, a big philanthropist, and uh -huh. he started a uh, nonprofit organization that's all about cross-cultural art, immersing artists into uh, environments where they get to, wow. they're allowed to create art, whatever they're inspired by their experience. Huh. So that's that's how the that whole, project came about. Yeah, I was born. But then we were over in India, and we're. It was right when Matsui came over, Ichiro, and uh -huh. there was, we, I love baseball so much, and we were talking, wouldn't it be great if we could make a documentary about Japanese high school baseball, and, you know, just, that's how, just an idea. Give me one idea. tidbit about Japanese, <laughs> I, I, now I really am interested, like, what, give me a, a, a what, what did you learn from doing this Japanese baseball documentary that you didn't know of before? Boston's a big baseball city, I know that. Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have much of a baseball team here. Miami Marlins, but you've won. Uh, the yeah, Miami Marlins. Kind of far. And then Tampa uh, Bay. We have Tampa Delaware's, Bay Rays, oh, yeah, yeah. too. They're but aside from side. there, like I'm just Orlando. We have MLS and we have our Imagine. basketball, yes. But tell me, like, I mean, you grew up with Boston Red Sox. Tell me about Japanese baseball now. I want to. Tell about the structure of the tournament. What, what makes that tournament so cool? Yeah, I mean, it's. 5,000 high school teams, uh -huh. 5,000 schools, they all have a team. Yeah. Basically every summer since 1915, they've been having an annual tournament where each region, each prefecture gets to play a tournament. And it's a single elimination tournament, so if you lose once, it's all over. Until next year. So, yeah. yeah. Dude, that's intense. <laughs> yeah, the NCAA tournament's intense, that's... That's even more. So yeah. it's like all these schools, I mean, if you play, you play no. one time and you're... Yeah, yeah, you play a. There's no bracket. Right? There's a whole bracket. There's bracket. Oh, oh, there's there's a bracket. Sixteen, right? Six, like you have to play like sixteen games in a row. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, there's so a I mean, uh, there's yeah. Uh, each state has their own tournament, but yeah. if you win that tournament, you get to go to the big tournament in Osaka, Hyogo Prefecture, wow. at the Koshin Stadium. So, basically, the idea was that you know we we read this book. Um, You've got to have Wa by uh, by Robert Whiting. Uh huh. There's this one small chapter about high school baseball. It's, and he talks about how it's the last purest form of baseball, and that's what really attracted us because schoolboys playing baseball just for the love of it is amazing. Yeah. And, you know, and the idea that I mean, Japanese people are famous for taking ideas and making it their own. Uh -huh. And what we had discovered was that they they took it and made it a martial art and uses uses baseball as part of education. So we're basically using a lens, like a baseball lens, into the Japanese spirit to learn about Japaneseness. Wow. That's really impressive. So after doing your project in India, then one in Japan, you started working on My Life in China. Yeah, I, I was you writing the this. success of being on PBS. We were part of POV's uh, the, this documentary showcase on PBS, uh, the 19th season. Wow. And we were really fortunate enough to have our film up there. We weren't even considering film festivals. We were just we just went for POV because we knew we didn't have, we didn't really want to have any other options. So, so I, I wrote the success of that, and I I applied for a uh, Guggenheim fellowship. Someone uh -huh. I met along the journey of the baseball film said, "You should really you know you made a great film. You should really get a try to write a proposal for a Guggenheim fellowship because you can make a film about whatever you want." And I'm, oh wow! Uh -huh. <laughs> so I decided to write the proposal for this because most of my life I, I've been, a, you know, I, I do a lot of film freelance stuff too, so mm -hmm. I noticed that in my work I was visiting all these different communities except my own community. My <laughs> yeah, it's personal. Yeah, but, and I notice I'm in India, Czech Republic, I go to uh, Japan, and where's the Chinese people? <laughs> Where are my people? Well, everywhere actually, but yeah, I mean, they're not in the, they're not in focus right. of yeah. your film, they're not the subject of your film. So then, this yeah. is an opportunity that you took on yeah. in the Guggenheim. I, it was a chance to make a film that, you know, I wasn't considering anyone, you know, any money-making ideal, any, you know, uh, yeah. thing, or no one telling me how to create anything, no studios telling me you have to do this so that you can be sold. So it's a completely independent film. It's a labor of love. This is as independent as it gets. 
And how did you come up with, <laughs> with the concept? With the grant, I guess, yeah. Yeah, with yeah, the, that's well, yeah, with let's, the yeah, grant. Yeah, well, you had to come up with yeah. the concept and the idea, mm -hmm. too, to receive the grant. Yeah. And that probably beat out a lot of other concepts and ideas yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So how did you come up with the concept? I, I wanted to sort of tie my father's story in, but I mean, I, I was thinking about modern day China and how it's very different from when my father was living there, because he obviously had to leave for desperate reasons, but I wanted to show different Chinese people moving for different reasons. Um, and your father was part of that story that you were going to weave yeah, with it was, the other stories. It was originally called Portraits of Modern Day China. Wow. <laughs> I sort of knew that I, I, had, I had all the access in the world with my father, so I knew that if we went over there and shot the bulk of my father's story and went to find these other three stories that if those three stories didn't work out, I could always fall back on my father's story. Yeah. So, but I really wanted to show the, the, the difference, the diaspora, the different uh, reasons for migrating. So we went to uh, Tibet and we, wow. we found a Chinese girl, a young like 17 year old Chinese girl that uh, brought Chinese massage. She's a masseuse. Uh -huh. So essentially she's bringing Chinese culture to Tibet and she's, wow. she's looking for a Tibetan boyfriend. She finds Tibetan men attractive. This okay. romance of it. So th here you have a she's girl. Young. Yeah, a young migration. She's very young. It's very not like t China's taking Tibetan uh, yeah. culture. They're bringing this girl's bringing her own to culture to Tibet, searching for love. You know, and, and we were so lucky to find that. That was yeah. one small story. We shot like enough to make a three-minute piece. Uh -huh. and then we went to Chengdu to uh, and eventually got to the Three Gorge Dam area, where you know it's the biggest hydroelectric yeah. dam project. In World. It's a city within its own. Yeah, it's it's amazing what they've done, but they, they had to relocate all these people, families, to take the land from them. So like a government land grab. So the, basically they relocated these people to this place called Chongming Island, mm -hmm. where it's it's this place, this uh, plantation, or then it yeah. just, it's, this, it's a working city, yeah. self-sustaining place. So that was a kind of different kind of migration. Uh -huh. And then we went to Beijing for the, before the Olympics when uh, they, we find the, these construction workers, these farmers. These mm -hmm. farmers leave their family and farms behind to go build for the Olympics. And they're making $30 a day, but it's the only option they have. But they, there's a source of pride that they're helping to better usher the in country, yeah, the country. Usher in the new era within China. Yeah, but the, the, the conditions were so bad. And it's amazing that he was still doing it. So the area. You, when you traveled there, did you uh, go with your dad immediately to his hometown, or did you travel elsewhere before coming back to see your dad, I guess. What is your, what was your path there? So we, we yeah, we shot, we went to Hong Kong, shot uh, with our family. Yeah. And then we did whatever we did in Hong Kong, then we went to Macau to shoot some scenes. Oh, wow. Because that's where he came ashore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's oh. the most powerful part of the film where he's talking about actually in the moment of, because what he did is he swam yes. four miles and this is something on that he would volleyball. repeat to you, right, yeah. when you were younger. So he's sitting there going, he's, he's sitting there and he's going, okay, so this is, so there were guards over here, we hit up in those mountains, we ran down, they said they sicked the dogs on us, you know, they were yelling, don't shoot, you know, he's just going and telling the story and then he goes on to tell about, because again, you can imagine a lot of people didn't survive that swim, so he's yeah. just talking about the, the emotion of what it was like to be that. And when I saw that, I was like, well, this is real. Seeing him and seeing the familiar mountain that he had, was that's giving me goosebumps, actually. So that probably that's a part that resonated with Yeah, me. I mean, for me, I, I actually didn't go shoot with him. Yeah. I, I came on you know, a couple of years afterwards in, in post-production and helped out with the, the story editing and, and finding the story. And, you know, there were just so many great moments. I mean, the, the, the greatest thing for me is kind of when, because you know, I'm very fortunate, you know, that I was raised by my, my parents were school teachers. Mm -hmm. And so they always, you know, taught me, you know, it was more important to be happy and pursue what you love than to make money. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was very, you know, I've been, I've found And they didn't ask you to be a doctor? Or no, a so everybody else did. Everybody else did. Everybody else did. You got a good test score. You should be a doctor or a lawyer. I'm like, well, I think I kind of want to be a writer. Thank you very much. But, um, so, and so it was, it was just neat because I had known that there was this emphasis, you know, with, you know, from talking to Ken about his, you know, just his story and then knowing a lot of other people that are, you know, first generation, you know, yeah. and, and just that push for the money. And then there's kind of a moment where, and the dad kind of realizes how good he's got. You know what I mean? Where yeah. he's, it's, instead of why did I make a bunch of money, it's like, well, my kids both went to grade school and they're both good people and they're both really educated. And it was yeah, kind of like, yeah, that's another, that was, you know, <laughs> realization. You know, too. something that I've been kind of trying to, you know, as a Midwestern kid who's, you know, a fifth generation American, kind of really trying to 
you know, elbow him about, like, you know, just like, you know, it's, it's okay because you don't have to be, you know, the 100% best at everything. You just need to do a really good job and take pride in it, you know, and just, you know, just be comfortable with who you are because, you know, yeah. he's a great, you know, he's a great guy, you know. So what, um, at what point um, did you feel that you connected with your dad the most? when you were filming? I mean, you did describe that one scene, or were there moments? I had the whole journey, but I mean, it culminated in the old house where we had him tell the story again. I mean, along mm -hmm. the whole uh, journey, there's this, we have him retell the story many different ways. Mm -hmm. And we're in the old house, and I don't know if it was because we had asked him so many times to talk about it, but. Well, I, th I think it was con connecting it to his mother, I think, when he was there and paid by Sean to her, I think that really yeah. made him realize what he was doing yeah. You know, where he was, because he'd always just kind of done it and gone forward, and now he realized like it was all for the family and all. Yeah, that. I mean, he didn't. He he started crying in this uh, this interview shot that we were just sitting there talking, and maybe he finally realized his own sacrifice. Because if, I feel like if you sacrifice, if you do something that's like very bold and big risk, you're not really thinking about mm -hmm. the ramifications. Yeah. You're just going for it. You don't think about, oh, I'm going to do this sacrifice for my yeah. future, my family. Yeah. It's it's just a noble. Act. Yeah. <laughs> you just you go for it. You're thinking, don't drown, don't drown, don't drown, don't right. You know. Yeah, you're just doing the immediate yeah. what's around and you, and what you're surrounding, but you're yeah. not realizing that. That's and then he house. got to Hong Kong and had to work, you know, deliver, you know, just doing basic, you know, labor and stuff like that. So he was, you know, get through the day, you know, yeah. get, through, you know get the couple of meals, you know. So I mean, we're we're there in that moment, and it's the longest shot in the whole film. But I wanted people to actually feel it in real time. Mm -hmm. when, it's, it was really my, he realized his own sacrifice, but then I also re finally realized who he was. Yeah. Wow. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. <laughs> so with the 200 hours that you shot, you whittled it down, how long did that take for you to do it? Like, <laughs> how long? I know you came on board but, through this process, yeah. so I just want to know I how... came on, I think, two, two and a half years into the process, and it took us another two and a half, three years from there. I mean, obviously, we were both working on other projects, but again, it was one of those, you know, we'd go away and think about it, and then, you know, we'd work on other projects, you'd have ideas, like, well, what if we tried this, or what if we tried that? I mean, actually, narratively, this story was a really good, uh, a good fit, because it's always, where do you begin, where do you end, you know, with, with especially with another documentary, but this, we had the, 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 it was nice that, you know, he gets on a plane from New York, flies over there, and then he comes yeah. back, so we had a nice, it was a nice kind of natural beginning and end, but it was then it was the question of in the middle, how do we you know get across the, the, the story elements and, mm -hmm. and the emotional elements and things like that. So, so all together, yeah. four and a half. Four and a half years. Years. Yeah, I mean, coming back, we, I poured all the, the, the fellowship into the production of it, mm -hmm. so I, I basically had no money <laughs> coming back. So, being poor your whole life, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> you, you have to you know, continue your freelance life. Mm -hmm. And so this being a labor of love, I, I was, I would chip away at the, the editing, you know, cut a few hours a night, you know, while I do other stuff. And that, you know, that took a few years and I even, you know, had to put it on the shelf. And I, that's when I, I went to the Czech Republic to shoot a different project because, you know, I, I had no choice. <laughs> I, I moved from New York, you know, went through the whole economic downfall, yeah. you know, didn't work for nine months, ended up moving to Los Angeles and, uh, changing my life and still trying to uh, chip away at it, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I almost gave up on it. Wow. Because it's it just, it's hard to get personal projects out that aren't mainstream ideas or, you know, themes that people, can, I don't know if people weren't ready to relate to a Chinese American story like five years ago. I'd give the old bootstrap speech. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just gotta do it. You and, gotta do it, yeah. That's, the, first, the first cut he asked me to look at was like four and a half hours long. Wow. So. <laughs> So that, so thank you. Oh, <laughs> I mean, the, I'm yeah. sure the four and a half, yeah. I, I just, two, uh, the 200 hours is probably all phenomenal footage, too. Yeah, I mean, we had an 85 minute cut, which we tried to make a film without any kind of voiceover or any kind of text or anything. That, mm -hmm. And the, the result was a film that really didn't have much information, so yeah, and people, the viewer had to work. But then we, we decided to go the whole other way and just put voiceover. My, my, personal voice describing, you know, narrating the whole story as the film is going along. And that that was, didn't work at all. <laughs> it was too overt and it just, it was bad. It was stepping on the emotion. Like the big thing we did is we, we, we took out the voiceover because instead of, we realized a lot of the voiceover was telling us things that were inherent, right? Mm -hmm. It's like now we go to Hong Kong. Well, you get <laughs> on a plane and you show up and you're in Hong Kong, duh. Yeah. But then also too, in, instead of, 
having Ken talk about how he felt felt in the moment, leaving that open, because the filmmaker's first priority is to make the audience feel something, mm -hmm. whether good, bad, or ugly, or in between. And um, you know, and so instead of you know, instead of him telling us how he feels, it it's, it, it opens it up for the, the viewer's personal experience. You know, or even myself, you know, I, you know, thinking about my relationship with my father or, you know, the, my family that immigrated or, you know, especially for, you know, folks like yourself that, you know, are very First connected to the story. And, um, wanting and, to preserve our culture. And have a, a, a stern Chinese father, you yes. know, who, who busted your chops the whole time, you know, so I think that And understanding really, where that comes from yeah. as well. So then the voiceover didn't work, so then we ripped everything out and we shortened it to 53. We thought the TV was, the, the, the TV time, like an hour yeah. program would be the best mm -hmm. outlet, so... We, we started using, I started working with a composer, Josh Geisler. He's, he writes for uh, Cirque, du Soleil, uh, Cirque du Soleil. Oh, wow. And okay. we decided to put music where the voiceover was. So in, the, in essence, the music is the voiceover. That's, and that's how we found our narrative voice. And, that's wonderful. And it's framed, the film is framed, you know, you go into the film knowing that it's a father-son story. So I wanted that to be apparent. You know, so there's a, you know, in the beginning, he's basically talking to me, who's the son, but it's also a filmmaker with his, mm -hmm subject, object, you know, so yeah. that I wanted to frame it that way so to drop the viewer in so that once you get to the house, you're with me, the, you're with me along the journey, along the way, and it hits, it hits the viewer like it hits me when I realize the sacrifice. And that's, mm -hmm. that's really the narrative style of the film, the point of view. Yeah. We just got an on? email the other day, oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk about it? Yeah. It <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, to, to continue the, what we're, hopefully, we're, we're nominated for, a, for the Best documentary feature at the Milano International Film Festival in Milan. That's pretty cool. And That's then, really, but really cool. I'm Leonardo da Vinci Society. So <laughs> you know, we'll and, then, take that, you know. and then we have uh, Boston Asian American Film Festival that uh, hopefully we it's going to, Yeah, it's going to be a great homecoming. And, and yeah, but we're, we're also going to hit up a few other festivals. Mm -hmm. We'll see if we can get What it. advice would you give to a young Asian American filmmaker? I mean, Chase your dream. I mean, if, if it's something you really care about and want to do, I mean, don't let anybody tell you you shouldn't do it. Uh, it's, it's, just do what you want. Be who you want to be. <laughs> Absolutely. Find, find your calling and just go for it. What makes you happy? That's the dome. Yeah, I mean, it, this is something I wanted to do before I moved on. I mean, I just didn't want to work on another project where I was observing people that I wasn't part of. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the next project, uh, we're, trying to launch is a film about this radio disc jockey that's 90 years old. He's, he, he's been spinning the oldies music for so long. And mm -hmm. he, Since they were newies. Alive. Yeah. The oldies <laughs> Since yeah. they were newies. <laughs> that's true. Where is this based out of? This is uh, sort of the Southwest uh, America, California, Palm okay. Springs, Bakersfield area. He's like 90 years old. He's, he has a five hour radio show every night. And he, he keeps the oldies alive, and all the oldies bands love him so How much. How did you find out about him? <laughs> oh, on the radio. Oh, yeah. he's just yeah. known. I'd be in the, my, coming home from freelance work, uh, sitting in traffic, turn on the radio, and he just provided me a, an appreciation for oldies music. Wow. Singing along the doo-wop, Rosie and the Originals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're excited for your upcoming project then. Thanks. So what's the, what's the documentary you're working on then? Um, or you're editing. Yeah, as, as we were getting this film out, I had the opportunity to uh, edit a different film. My, my friend Curtis Chin, who uh, we, we found through UCLA, um, he's, he, he's been shooting this film about the middle school test in New York City. It's the SHSAT. It's a big controversy. And there there there's this NAACP complaint that uh, the test is unfair. I mean, it's this one single test that all kids take in New York City. Really? Middle school, uh, school kids, students, uh, that take this test to go to these prestigious public schools. And they're saying that the, it's actually unfair, unfair because there are people doing test prep, there, there's mm -hmm. people putting money into their kids' test prep, so they're going in well prepared. Yeah. It's not fair to the poorer communities where they don't, they can't afford, you know, have their kids go through those things. But there's also government programs that offer free programs t to take advantage of. There's like this this balancing act to uh, this, yeah. this social economical lands this study that can be done to figure out where, where the problems lay. So That's this great. this one test is very controversial. Yeah. Like, there's a big complaint that the Asians are gaming the system by you know they have this big community in Sunset Park and Queens and Brooklyn where it's nonstop test prep, but it's all voluntary. But in Asia, that's literally. Yeah. Um, and you have family in Asia too. Um, I know that my 
cousins go to school seven days a week, 24 hours a day almost. Mm -hmm. Like they're constantly, like they're either in tutoring, but that's something that we, my parents grew up mm -hmm. with. And it's that's the only something. way for mobility. It's the uh, way to improve your life, which is to get your education. And so to, when you say that it is unfair and that they have these communities, to me it's kind of like, well, those are what the parents are used to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, just, just I think the, like that's what they're bringing from yeah. their first. Their like, yeah, the emphasis and the culture. Yeah. And, there's also other things too, where it's like you know, kids that on the Upper West Side are taking this test, and if they don't get in, they'll just go to a forty thousand dollar year private school. You know? and so there's, and you know, the, again, I you know, see it as, okay, well, maybe we should have more than three good high schools in New York City. Yeah, that's you know, the thing, yeah, maybe improve the whole school system. Why, why make it these elite schools? So that's the second part of the documentary. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a precursor. You know, that's, <laughs> that's a precursor. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just speaking as a fan, but I'm, I'm really excited to see it. That's too. really, that's, so that's a project that you're currently working on as well. Yeah, and I mean, I, I do believe that education is definitely the equalizer. That's yeah. an important thing. You guys had some attention from the certain yeah, I mean, uh, White House has contacted us. New York Times has um, requested an op docs, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, ed education conferences that are uh, calling us and trying to invite us to screen our film. And it's it's very it's a very hot topic right now. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's a busy festival week for everybody, so um, we appreciate you being here and giving Asia Trend the time. Um, once again, we're sitting here with Aaron Parks and uh, director Kenneth Ang of My Life in China. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you to the you. Asian community of Orlando for coming out and support us. You're it's been, welcome. It's been amazing. It's been thank amazing. you. Thank you to Asia Trend. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome.